Thank you for having me here. It's a delight to be here on this occasion. And uh, along with my friends and colleagues, uh, many of you may not know that uh, Bill Craig and I were classmates in our days at Trinity. And so we only, although we live in Atlanta, we bump into each other in other parts of the world. So I think he's following immediately after this. And of course, you've heard from several of the others. Uh, I'm going to respond to this subject not on the basis of my book. Some of you may have seen uh, my book, the, the response to Sam Harris. He'd written one on the end of faith, and I responded to that book some years ago called The End of Reason. And if I were to do that, it would be just to, I see Bill sitting right there, that you could uh, easily pick it up and read it for yourself rather than just reiterating what I've stated to you out there. Instead, what I'd really like to do is trace for you how all of this actually came about. I remember as a young undergraduate student, uh, actually graduate student in the 80s, uh, listening to Francis Schaeffer. He had arrived in Toronto, and I was listening to him speak at that time. And he and Everett Koop were doing a series of lectures on whatever happened to the human race. And as he was talking and projecting where we were headed, I wondered if it was just sort of an overextended way of thinking, extrapolating to ends that we might never get or reach, that some reformer or some thinker somewhere would put a stop to that kind of uh, logical outworking that they were clearly pointing out with our secularized consciousness. But the fact of the matter is, just about everything that they said turned out to be right on. In fact, if anything, uh, it went even beyond what they were projecting would happen. But since we are going to get into some very heavy-duty thinking and have been doing that all afternoon, I want to read for you something that uh, borders a little bit on the lighthearted. Some of you may have heard me uh, use this before, but I think it's, 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 it makes for a good starting point. It's called A Touching Story, The Heart of a Musician, and maybe the brain also. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at the graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the Kentucky backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost. I finally arrived an hour late, and I saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt bad and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave, and I looked down, and the vault lid was already in place. I don't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I'd never played before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept. We all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> There's nothing like a deeply moving message for the wrong audience at the wrong crowd on the wrong occasion, and yet being so stirred in your emotions that you've done a wonderful job. <laughs> That's what often, often happens in our society. We have come so adrift from our biblical moorings, at least the ideas that steadied this nation and the better part of the world, where so much was rooted in the notion of the ineradicable difference between good and evil. Facts by which we had built our legal systems, our notions of justice, the very value of human life, how intrinsic worth was given to every human being, not extrinsic worth, conveyed by some will or fair power or so, so, such uh, authorities to which we look for our definitions in these days. So much has changed. So much is now, as Chesterton would say, with our feet firmly planted in midair. 
We just have no grounding anymore to define some of the most essential values which we assumed for many years. Just about 10 days ago, I was speaking at the United Nations prayer breakfast, and I was talking to them implicitly on the very notion of what it meant to be human. I ask you this, does it make any sense to even talk about human rights when we don't give a person the right to be human? Where we do not know the definitions for things that are so essential to life, the very possibility of life, the existence of life, the sacred meaning of marriage, of sexuality, all of these have been desacralized. And the only one now who's considered obnoxious is the one who wants to posit the sacredness of these issues. Many years ago, in the 1980s, Daniel Yankelovich in Atlantic Monthly wrote an article on the changing rules of American life. And three decades have gone by and we've seen the implications of what the secular thinker had analyzed in his article. And here's what he said as a beginning definition, quoting the sociologist Daniel Bell. Listen carefully, please. He says, culture is an effort to provide a coherent set of answers to the existential questions that confront all human beings in the passage of their lives. Do you hear that? To provide a coherent set of answers to the existential questions that confront all human beings in the passage of their lives. And a genuine cultural revolution then is one that makes a decisive break from the shared meanings of the past, particularly those which relate to the deepest questions of the purpose and nature of human life. So if the, if the goal is to find a coherent set of answers to the existential questions that confront all of us in the pursuit of our lives, and that a cultural revolution is underway when we make a decisive break from the shared meanings of the past, particularly those that relate to the purpose and nature of human life. Now, if you take that definition alone, there's enough there to try to unpack. I'm not going to try to unpack this, but this alone tells me that when you're looking for definitions or deviations, you have to go back to the original assumption of what is the purpose and the nature of human life. So questions of moral reasoning can only truly be postulated if we have assumed on a common purpose. If we vary in our purpose, how are we ever going to arrive at our conclusions? You know, I could give you three simple analyses of how cultures function. There's going to be a speed course in it, but just a two and a, two and a half minute type thing. Cultures are defined in sort of three different ways. One is called a theonomous culture. Theonomous, theos God, nomos law where it is assumed in the mainstream and the flow of the culture that the Theos, the God, whom we all sort of in some sense subscribe to, has put his law into our hearts so that we act intuitively from that kind of reasoning. One of the best cultures to exemplify this is the Indian culture, the culture, culture in which I was raised. The respect for parents, the love for family, and all of these, and the heritage play a vital part. In a sense, it's a theonomous type of culture where the divine imperatives are sort of planted within the heart or the conscience of every human being. We move then to a heteronomous culture. Heteros meaning different, nomos law, a different law, where there is a superimposition upon a culture from an exterior source. In religious terms, Islam is a heteronomic culture. You are told and dictated to from the outside, your dietary laws, your celebratory festivals, how you are to practice it, all of your practices are dictated to you from, a, from another source, an authoritative source, Islam has that heteronomic value implicit in its own teaching. It is a, there's a, no dispute on that. They would accept that as a fair description. And in uh, secular ideas, Marxism would be that kind of a heteronomous culture where the few dictate the values of the many. So you've got theonomous, 
God's law sort of in our, in our own hearts and we move along as a culture with the Quran sort of values. Hieronymus, where we are told from the outside what our dictates should be. But then there is an autonomous culture, autos meaning self, nomos law, where each one is a law unto himself or herself. And America would probably describe herself as an autonomous culture, where every individual dictates his or her own moral reasoning. The fascinating thing that has happened in our time even though we are told we are an autonomous culture, if my values autonomously then move to the fact that life is sacred, all of a sudden a heteronymous culture takes over in dictating to me that I have no right to believe it and share that in a community and in any sense of dissenting value systems. Hope you followed what I've said, that if I have autonomy, why is it all of a sudden, if I believe that life is sacred and the values that I hold to are sacred, that all of a sudden I'm told from outside sources, yes, we are in theory autonomous, but you had daren't ever tell the public audience what you believe is right and wrong. Only my belief can be shared as it disagrees with yours. You have no right to ultimately publicly proclaim what you believe. So are we really autonomous then? Or do we bait and switch, allow the person to believe they're autonomous, but if they violate this, we become suddenly heteronymous. That is the new worldview under which the term tolerance really operates. That's the new worldview under which the word tolerance really operates. Now, how did all of this come about? I share with you three dramatic changes that took place. The first is called secularization. Secularization is the process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. It is a process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. One satirist puts it this way. First, dentistry was painless, then bicycles were chainless, and carriages were horseless, and many laws enforceless. Next, cookery was fireless, telegraphy was wireless, cigars were nicotineless, and coffee caffeineless. Soon, oranges were seedless, the putting green was, needle, was weedless, the college boy was hatless, the proper diet fatless. New motor roads are dustless, the latest steel is rustless, our tennis courts, courts are sodless, our new religion godless. That is secularization in action where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. When this happens, a cultural inversion takes place. And let me move to illustrate this for you so that I can move quickly to my second and third sociological phenomena that I think brought all of this about. I remember in the 1980s when I moved to, uh, to Atlanta from Toronto, we were living in Toronto prior to that, watching the transcripts of a trial that had taken place with the pornographic entrepreneur, Larry Flint. And the general opinion was that Larry Flint's pornography was so off the charts that he even made Playboy magazine look quite normal and acceptable, that the deviance to which he had gone was absolutely unthinkable and lawless court cases were brought against him. But the lawyer defending Larry Flint was very clever. The first thing he did was he said he only wanted people on a jury who did not belong to any church. And so that took a while for them to find somebody in the South who didn't belong to any church. So it took many, many days till the jury was complete. And then when the witnesses came to testify against uh, Mr. Flint, the lawyer defending Flint went about it this way. He would say to them this, uh, have you ever been into an art gallery? Yes. Have you ever paid to go into an art gallery? Yes. Have you ever paid to go into an art gallery where you've seen paintings by the great masters of art of unclothed people? Yes. Will you please tell uh, this jury why you call that art and paid to go in to see it and you call my client stuff pornography? On a witness box, how do you even deal with this? You're not going to get into some philosophical argument on the way you arrive at ethical values and so on, not with a lawyer with all of his uh, uh, neuronic stare gazing down at you like that. And I thought to myself, you know, what would I say? What would I say to him? 
I suppose sitting across a coffee table, I could chat with the lawyer and I could say something like this. I'm not sure it'll make any difference to him. I could say something like this. Have you ever read the biography of Michelangelo? Have you ever read the conversation that took place between Michelangelo and his teacher while they were discussing this issue of painting disrobed human bodies? And the teacher looked at Michelangelo once and said to him, can you tell me why you are doing this? And Michelangelo said to him, because I want to see man as God sees man. And Michelangelo looked at him and said, but you're not God, are you? And the writer of Michelangelo's biography just moves on from that without even bothering to sort of deal with this anymore. But I think the ultimate argument has to filter down into something more engaging on the issue of reason here. So please track me with me. When C.S. Lewis, in his book, gave his allegorical, in allegorical fashion, his story of his conversion, uh, Pilgrim's Regress. The reason he calls it a Pilgrim's Regress rather than Progress is because if you know Lewis's conversion story, how he moved from one worldview to another, from atheism to pantheism, he struggled with pantheism for some time, till ultimately, in his words, he was dragged into the kingdom, kicking and screaming, the most reluctant convert in all of England, and then he went on to say, I thought I'd come to a place, I found out I'd come to a person. That's the first line of that close next chapter. I thought I'd come to a place. I found out I'd come to a person. And this theistic framework and this relationship then redefined everything. But in this allegorical journey, while he's going through the philosophy of humanism, the incredible thing is that he pictures himself as a man sitting in a mountain called the spirit of the age, bound in chains. That's an amazing description of the humanistic worldview for a man in the thick of it. You would think of him as robust and free, without any law, but he pictures himself as bound and in chains. And the waiter comes and offers him a glass of milk, and he unbinds his chains, and he takes the milk, and he's drinking it, and he makes the comment, this is delicious, nutritious milk. The waiter looks at him and says, you just call it delicious, nutritious milk. It's nothing more than the secretion of a cow. So the cow secretes urine, it secretes milk. What's the difference? And then young John makes the mistake of saying, I should never have said it, but I commented on the tastiness of the eggs. And at this point, the analogy he drew, I won't draw for you. <laughs> quite pathetic, quite nauseating, really. And he said he just groaned under that description, finished his breakfast, hurriedly pushed the tray away. And then he says this, all of a sudden, reason came riding on a horse and rescued me and said to the waiter, you lie, you lie. You don't know the difference between what nature's meant for nourishment and what nature's meant for garbage. You see, at least in the grand artist scheme of things, maybe in the portrayal of the human body, however it was done with whatever intent, all right, you give that artist the benefit of the doubt. But when a young woman or man unclad is in front of the lens of a camera for the pure purpose of titillating the baser instincts in the mind of another person to a point where it will almost ineradicably ruin their minds and imagination and ultimately take them to a point of even the ruination of their marriage, is that mere art? How many people do you find who go into an art gallery, come back and say, you know, I saw a painting on the wall and it ruined my marriage ultimately. <laughs> but the woman in front of that lens or the young man in front of the lens ought to look at the photographer and say, don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me in this dehumanization process of just so destroying the imagination of someone in an insatiable way that they'll never be satisfied. But when secularization has had its full course, a young man or a young woman like that will never do it. Do you know why? Because the process of secularization, when it's done its work, will ultimately destroy a sense of shame within a culture. You take shame away. You take shame away from a highly educated person and you've got a monster in the making. It's precisely what Hitler wrote, exact words, when he has them pinned today on Auschwitz. 
I want to raise a gen generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. No shame, no guilt. Even today, psychiatrists are wrestling with the possibility of a drug that can actually deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But their great struggle of their own consciences, if we can find a drug which can take away and deal with the memory of these horrific things that were done under their watch, what if a rapist takes of the morning after and wipes out his own memory of all the awful things that he did? Can we afford to invent a drug that a murderer or a rapist can actually ingest the next morning and have no sense of shame and no sense of remorse, no sense of regret? The danger with the kind of world that the Sam Harrises ultimately say, not, not with intent, but with logical outworking, is that it'll produce a generation of men and women without shame. And I'll tell you, the tragedy of that is a production of hell. Just three days ago, I had one of those landmark experiences in my life. I was talking to some of my colleagues at dinner on this last night. You know, I've done this now, been a speaker on the circuit for nearly four decades. And if I were to take eight or 10 moments in life that defined me, I would say this Tuesday of this week defined some of that for me. I was at Angola prison, speaking to 5,300 prisoners, 80% of whom are on life without parole. Think of that. On death row, there were 45 with whom my friends and I walked past and chatted, put our hands through the bars, shook hands with them. A tiny little cot, a tiny night table, the toilet there, no doors, nothing, just the bars, and they share televisions. I talked to one young guy there, I wouldn't name him for you, well, uh, relatively young. I said, how long have you been? I'm not allowed to ask how long they've been there. I just said, how are you doing? He said, fine. He said, I've been here 16 years on death row, you know. I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 35. I said, you were here from when you were 19? He said, yes, sir. And I was not allowed to ask why they're there. He looked at me and he said, I got involved with organized crime when I was 16. And he said, like a dog going back to the vomit, I kept going back and kept going back. And the things I did, I wouldn't even describe for you. And here I am now, waiting the final day till they'll take me out for my last meal and do away with me. You know what? When you go to the execution chamber, it's a very sobering thing to look at. In fact, when I came back, I'm, I'm still processing it, still processing it. I told my wife, I said, I want to take every member of my team there. They have this stretcher laid out with straps and the, in the injection that is finally given. It used to be electrocuted, now the injection is given. And the prisoners there build coffins. But they asked the prisoners if they would build this bed on which the injection was administered. They refused, because they said our own mates will be killed on that. Interesting, isn't it? Men who are probably there for killing somebody else didn't want to create an instrument that would kill their own mates and their own buddies. It tells you that deep inside your conscience there is that struggle that goes on on the sacredness of life and the inviolability of it. When they lost their sense of shame, they destroyed other lives. When the sober-minded thinking came back, they said, we can't do anything like this. Secularization has a deadly effect when it is uninformed by a transcendent moral order. Pluralization is the next way, wave with which we moved where there is a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no one worldview is dominant. A competing number of worldviews available to its members and no one worldview is dominant. Pluralization is a good thing to have a competing now, to have different accents, to have different languages. Uh, there's a fast food outlet in Los Angeles. It's a, where a Korean is selling kosher tacos. That's quite a culinarily pluralistic offering out of his little wagon out there. Quite fascinating to watch. When I first came to Canada, when I was 20 years old, there were 500 Indians in Toronto. 500. Today, they're all there in taxis waiting for you at the airport to pick you up. 
There's 500,000 of them in Toronto now. Toronto is where I'd moved to and lived for 10 years, where I met my wife and married. When I came to Toronto at that time, if I saw another Indian, you'd cross the street to say hello and say, Chai Pina, I want to go and have a cup of tea. Now if you did that, you'd do nothing else. The whole, the whole the demog demographic has changed in these cultures. Pluralism is a good thing. But if pluralism is extended to mean relativism, then it's a deadly thing. If a relativistic ethic is espoused, then you end up with, a, with, a, with, a, with the lowest common denominator. Some of you may have heard me give this illustration, but you let me hasten through it as time is fleeting by. Then I'll read an application, move to my final thought here. I remember many years ago in California, uh, speaking to a, Cali to a Californian audience, and a professor of philosophy as an American came forward, and he'd said he had converted to a pantheistic worldview. He walked forward, and he said to me, I can't believe that you're actually talking all this stuff about following Jesus Christ and all of that. He said, I tell you what, I teach philosophy nearby. I'll bring my whole class, and one of these nights you're here. You, do you speak on why you're not a Hindu, and my class will just take you apart. I said, no, sir, I won't do that. He said, why not? I said, I've heard long ago when you throw mud at others, not only do you lose a lot of ground, you get your hands dirty in the process. He didn't think it was very funny. So I said, okay, let me try it another way. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will speak to you, speak on the subject, why I am a Christian, and you bring all of your class, uh, students, and we can, they can take me apart then. He said, well, I don't like that, but, but then we, I said an implicit in what I say will be what do you want me to address anyway. So he brought his students, and they sat there smugly like this. At the end of it, he came forward, and this is exactly what he said to me. You have done the greatest damage to the pantheistic world you have ever had any man, heard any man ever do, and the reason is you don't understand it. That's a classic line. I said, let me get this straight. You are an American gentleman teaching philosophy. I am an Indian whose ancestors were Hindu priests. And I'm a Nambudri, the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood, and I'm coming here. And without even knowing me, you're telling me I don't understand what this is all about, and you do? <laughs> I said, let's see, let's do a favor, let's go out for lunch. I pulled the great line of Josh McDowell, I said, you pay, and I'll pray, and we'll go out and eat. <laughs> yeah. So he said, can I bring a professor of psychology? I wanted to ask him why, whether we were going to be analyzed or what. I said, yeah, but I'm going to talk to you, I said. I said, all your students say, hey, I'm not here to impress them. I want to talk to you. You and I talk, and he can listen on. He said, all right. So we sit down and talk, and he begins a speech with a wrong statement. He said, Mr. Zacharias, there are two kinds of logic. Yeah, I knew right off the bat he had not studied much of logic. There's more kinds of logic than that, but you don't destroy a person right from the beginning. So he said, OK. <laughs> There's two kinds of logic. I said, explain them to me. So the first one is called the law of non-contradiction, either or. It's either this or that. It's the law of non-contradiction. It's a Western way of thinking. I said, no, it is not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. Yeah, he said, I said, no, it's not. He said, who are you to tell me no, it's not? It is, it is the Western way of thinking. I said, all right, move on. <laughs> he said, the next is the dialectical system of thinking. It's not either this or that. It's both of this and that. It's the Eastern way of thinking. I said, no, it isn't. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. Finally, I said, move on. He said, you see, when you were talking about either this way to truth or that way, you were thinking as an East, you were thinking as an East, you were thinking as a Westerner. You should really have been thinking as an Easterner. So if you're thought as an Easterner, when you see a contradiction, it wouldn't bother you. You're becoming too Western. You're seeing this either or stuff. And when you see a contradiction, you see a stop there. Don't stop there. Just think like an Easterner and accept both of these. And he went on and on. I said, I have a question for you. You're telling me the two kinds of logic. Yes, there's either the either or system of logic or there's the both hand system of logic. He said, yes. And my problem is that I'm thinking actually as a Westerner either or. Well, I should be thinking as an Easterner, both hand. He said, that's right. I said, will you help me then? When I'm studying pantheism, I either use the both hand system or nothing else. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> that I either use the both hand system of logic or nothing else. Is that what you're telling me? The psychologist looked at him and said, I think we should go now. <laughs> and let me quote to you what he said. 
the either or does seem to emerge, doesn't it? <laughs> I said, I got news for you, sir. Even in India, you look both ways before you cross the street. It is either the bus or me, <laughs> not both of us. <laughs> you know what he, uh, what he has done? He has mixed up the popular expression of a worldview and forgotten the original protagonists of those worldview. If Gautama Buddha were both hand, why did he reject the Vedas? Why did he reject the caste system? Why did he found Buddhism? He was born a Hindu. Shankara, the main seminal thinker of monism in, in, in Eastern philosophy, determinedly he was uh, an either-or thinker. And the, when his mother became a worshiper of gods, they asked him, what on earth is this? You said that's false. He said, well, she's in the process. She will emerge into the monistic way of thinking and find out all of this was a scaffolding she needed to shake off. G.K. Chesterton, describing the tragedy of this both hand type thinking, says this, the new rebel is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never be a true revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. So he writes one book complaining that imperial oppression insults the purity of women, and then he writes another book, a novel, in which he insults it himself. He curses the Sultan because Christian girls lose their virginity, then curses Mrs. Grundy because they keep it. As a politician, he cries out that war is a waste of life, then as a philosopher that life Life itself is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant, then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. A man denounces marriage as a lie, then denounces aristocratic profligates for treating it as a lie. He calls the flag a bubble, then blames the oppressors of Poland or Ireland because they take away that bubble. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts, then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beast. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he's lost his right to rebel against anything. And the rock musician says, cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeon scream for more from paranoia's poison door, 21st century schizoid man. Death seed, blind man's greed, poet starving, children bleed, nothing he's got he really needs, 21st century schizoid man. Blood rack, barbed wire, politicians, funeral pyre, innocents raped with napalm fire, 21st century schizoid man. The walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. Will no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams? Between the iron gates of fate, the seeds of time are sown and watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind I see is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh, but I'm afraid tomorrow I'll be crying. The death of reason. The end of reason. When the advent relativism is absolutized to a point where you become the self-referencing point of all moral reasoning. Ladies and gentlemen, secularization leads you to no sense of shame. In the 60s, we began to see this encroaching into our culture. Pluralization on the heels of all of that in the academy, the law of non-contradiction was assaulted. And the so-called both hand, which is really not ultimately lived out anyway, takes takes wings and soars into our cultural ethos. And when I look upon it and say, the end of it is the end of shame and secularization, the end of reason and pluralization, which leads you to the last, and that is privatization. Privatization is a cleavage, a breakdown in your experience between your public and your private life, and you're forced to find meaning in your private life. 
there's a cleavage, there's a breakdown. And what happens when that takes place? What happens is a complete loss and a complete death of meaning. No shame, no reason, no meaning. That's where we are today. That's where we are today. That's why you have come here today. Because you know the answers of the world are just not making sense and you're hungry to find what is the best way to communicate this. You know, I was only 17 years old when I ended up on a bed of suicide. I know what it is to hunger for meaning and not have it. I know what it is to be ashamed of the way my life was going and not wanting to ever face people. I knew the irrationality of my own choices and that the thing that I least expected, least expected, a man walked into my hospital room with a Bible. And the words of Jesus to Thomas, because I live, you also shall live so struck to my heart like a pierced instrument would. As we walked away from Angola, the chaplain to the University of Virginia basketball and football teams, a guy about 6'6", 250, big guy, George Morris, walked away and he's walking beside me back to the plane and he says, you know, Ravi, in every cell I saw a Bible. But if we put that same Bible in our high schools today, they'll take us to court for invading into the life of young men and women. He said, I guarantee you that if more of those Bibles are in those high schools, there'll be less of these people behind these bars today. I want to leave you with two thoughts. Daniel Yankelevich ended his article with this after he surveyed several individuals and couples. If you feel it is imperative to fill all your needs and these needs are contradictory or in conflict with those of others or simply unfillable, then frustration inevitably follows. To Abby and to Mark, whom I interviewed as well, self-fulfillment meant having a career and marriage and children and sexual freedom and autonomy and being liberal, and having money, and choosing nonconformity, and insisting on social justice, and enjoying city life, and country living, and simplicity, and graciousness, and reading, and good friends, and on and on. The individual is not truly fulfilled by becoming ever more autonomous. Indeed, to move too far in this direction is to risk psychosis, the ultimate form of autonomy. He said the injunction that to find oneself, one must lose oneself, contains a truth any seeker of self-fulfillment needs to grasp. The injunction that to find oneself, one must lose oneself, contains a truth any seeker of self-fulfillment needs to grasp. About three or four years ago, I was in Syria. And when I arrived in Syria, the intelligence officers always called me, the chief of intelligence asked if he could see me and talk to me first and uh, invited me there, welcomed me there. He said, please don't get into any politics here. I said, I won't, sir. And then after we uh, were finished, I was taken to see Sheikh Hussein, who's the leading Shiite cleric in Syria. We dialogued for three hours in front of an audience. I could ask him one question on Islam, he would answer it. He could ask me one question on Christianity, I would answer it. And we agreed that be cordial, and not in any way insulting or, or mean-spirited, just honest questions. Sheikh Hussein was a real gentleman. We had the interpreter sitting between us. She would interpret my thoughts to him and his thoughts to me. I'll never forget, as the time was coming to a close, Sheikh Hussein looked at me as a leading Shiite cleric in Syria. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Dr. Zacharias, he said, I think I have to say something to you. Maybe it's about time we as Muslims stopped asking if Jesus died on the cross and start asking why.
I said, Sheikh Hussein, do I have your permission to quote you, sir? He said, yes, you can. When you see a society without shame, without reason, and without meaning, take a look at the cross again and try to understand what the word redemption actually means. It goes way beyond forgiveness. It goes way beyond acceptance. It goes to the point of revaluing, redeeming you, and giving you that fresh sense of worth and value as God intends to have in his relationship with you. Douglas Copeland, in his book, Life After God, this secular thinker, this Canadian thinker, ends his book with these words, and I end with this quote. He talks about his friends in British Columbia. He left and wandered around each in a different direction, ultimately ending up far away from all belief except their own indulgent lifestyle. Here's how he ends. He says, now here is my secret. I tell you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray. I pray? So I pray you are in a quiet room as you hear my words. My secret really is this. I need God. I need God. I am sick and can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem desirous or capable of giving. To help me to be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness. To help me live, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. So ends his book. I need God. I need God. Without God, Reason is dead. Hope is dead. Morality is dead. Meaning is gone. In Christ, you recover all of these. So I commend the organizers for having a conference such as this, and I thank you for giving me your attention. May God richly bless you.